morning. We're, um, like I said, finishing out this morning our series called Values that we've been going through. In, uh, in, we're going to finish that out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but um, just as we've done each week, I want to just kind of summarize, because for some of y'all this might be your first week with this, um, what we're talking about when I say the word values. A few years back, our church set out um, sort of on a, on a, on a, on a mission to, to look through the scriptures and to ask the question, how do we want to talk about what it means to be uh, a church that follows the scriptures? We want to have scriptural values as a church and as a people. And so uh, through, our, through our work together as our leadership team worked through this, came up with a mission statement and came up with six core biblical values. And so our mission is that we are inviting our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus. And that's our way of talking about the Great Commission that Jesus gave each and every one of his disciples to say, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that, he com- that, that I commanded you, right? So we go and we invite our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus. And we talked last week extensively about who our neighbor is, right, through this story of the Good Samaritan. We're going to kind of cover a little bit of that again this morning. Um, then we, our, six, our six biblical values, the first one is this, that Jesus is first, that we center everything on his love and grace because he alone has set us free, that it's the love of Christ, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, that, that controls us. It's his, his work on the cross that motivates us. He, we put him first. Uh, that we trust the Bible, that we depend on the scriptures as our, as our primary guide for life because God leads us most directly through his word. That um, the, the next one is that we journey together, that church is more than just a place to attend. It's a family that we belong to, that we are designed to grow when we follow Jesus together. And that togetherness is a a critical part, right? Right when uh, Jesus uh, was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said, love the Lord your God. And and then he said, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The two go hand in hand, right? Our relationship with God inspires us to love and to journey with others. Um, And then the last three are this, that we call, we, um, Nope. Yep. Mm-hmm. That we collaborate rather than compete. That Jesus has one body, and we're all on His team. We look to we we work together with others who are seeking His kingdom first. That we don't believe as a church that we are in competition with the church down the street or the church across town. That that Jesus, when He looks at the church, He sees one unified body, and if that's how He sees it, then that's how we should see it. Um, that we believe in, um, in holding God's gifts with open hands, that God gives us each our stuff, right? Our resources, our experiences, our abilities, so that we can share them generously with others. This is the, uh, what we talked about last week as we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan is a beautiful story of an individual who didn't see their stuff as their own, but when they saw someone in need... They shared those things with somebody who, um, who needed them. And, then, and isn't that really a picture of what Jesus did for us, right? Who, who saw us in need and didn't walk by on the other side of the road like the priests and Levite did, but instead stopped and addressed the need that we had for a Savior. This week we want to talk about how we hold fast to the mission while adapting our methods, that the truth of the gospel never changes, and we trust the Holy Spirit to help us creatively reach our community. This is the idea that the gospel, the mission, the, the, the message of the church, right, for, for 2,000 years has not changed. It has been the message of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. That's the message. You can't change it. Uh, But what does change is the people that hear the message, right? And so the language that we used or the way we talk about that message may have to change. How many of you recognize that we live in a a time of changing culture? Of like, I don't, if you're somebody uh, who's seen a little bit more decades than than me, for, for instance, right? You say, I would be able to recognize even since I was in high school, I'm turning 30 in a few weeks, okay? So it hasn't been that long. Um... That, that I, don't, I don't recognize certain things about our culture, right? When I hang out with middle schoolers, when I hang out with high schoolers, I get confused, 
right? Um, and so I can only imagine what it's like for some of y'all who have had, maybe had a couple extra decades to see those changes, right? And our changing culture doesn't mean that we change the message. But what it does mean is that we have a responsibility to God and to the people around us to talk about the message in a way that makes sense to people. Does that make sense? So that's what I want to talk about this morning. But I want to do that by really briefly looking again so hopefully you're in 2 Corinthians 5, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I really briefly, again, want to just talk about this Good Samaritan story that we talked about last week. So I'm going to put it up on the screen and, and just read it. And then I have one, a one thing I wanted to say last week, but I ran out of time, and it turns out that was because I was supposed to say it this week. So, so this is the story that Jesus get, uh, the, the parable that Jesus tells. It's a made-up story to, to make a point, right? That's what a parable is. And so he tells this story to this person asking him a question. He says, um, the, 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 it's the lawyer from the story before, right? It says in verse 29, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and, he de- and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought Uh, him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, that's uh, two coins that would have been worth about a couple hundred dollars in our money today. And he gave him to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. And then Jesus said, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And so we have here um, in the Good Samaritan story, ironically enough, we're talking this morning about Operation Christmas Child, which is a program run by an organization called Samaritan's Purse, right, who takes their name from this, this story, this idea of being generous and sharing with others even if we really don't know them, even if we don't really, uh, they wouldn't be somebody we would classically be considered to be our neighbor. They're just somebody we happened along, right? And, and so the, this idea of the word Samaritan has taken on all of these, these meanings now in our own language, right? This idea, you, don't even, you don't even have to be a Christian to know what a good Samaritan is, right? A good Samaritan is somebody who sees a need and meets a need. Um, that person who pulls, pulls over when they see the, 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 the person on the side of the road with a white cloud of smoke, right, kind of pouring out of the radiator. And, and so a good Samaritan is somebody who stops and does what, they, what best they can do to lend a hand. If I did that, I wouldn't know what to do. So I just keep driving, right? But, um, <laughs> which is not the point of the story. But so when we think about the good Samaritan story, what Jesus says is, you go and do likewise. And he says the story isn't just a cute uh, hallmark moment, it's an example for us to follow. And so often when we think about following the example of the Good Samaritan, we think about physical problems, right? We think about that person who's stranded on the side of the road. We think about, this happens to me because I'm tall, right? Um, I'm not really that tall, but I'm taller than some of you. And so every now and then if I'm in Walmart, I'll have, somebody will approach me and ask for me to reach something on the top of the shelf, Right? This has ever happened to any of you tall people, or is it only me? Okay, Shane, of course, it happens to you all the time. <laughs> and so, you know, these little moments, right, where we get to be a neighbor to somebody. But I think one of the biggest ways that we can be an example and follow the example of the Good Samaritan is by not just meeting physical needs, but by meeting people's very real spiritual need. What we fail to recognize sometimes is that the roads that we walk in life, in our workplace, and maybe even in our home, or in our community, 
are littered with the bodies of people who are spiritually dying because they don't know about Jesus. And unless somebody sees them, has compassion on them, right, and stops their journey, moves to them, bandages their wounds and cares for them, and then not only that, put them on the horse and take them to the inn and treat them all that day and then take care of their needs. Notice how involved the process is, right, for the, for the Samaritan. Unless somebody stops, they're going to die, right? That's the story of the Good Samaritan played out in, well, if, we, if we put on spiritual eyes and we see, right, that the the, the world that we are in, that we often complain about and are frustrated about the way people are today or the way our culture is, the reason it is that way is because people need Jesus. And we've got him that we can share. So, the question is, will we see that greatest need and will we, will we be moved to action to, to help meet it? We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 5, so if you would, turn your Bible over there. I want to read that chapter now as we, um, as we turn over there. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, uh, Paul tells the church in Corinth this. He says, We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put our heavenly dwelling, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, that we would be clothed further, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and I would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all, and this is really important, if you're you're a highlighter of your Bible, if you're an underliner, if you like to write in your Bible, I would do that for verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Um. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is what we are is known to God, and I hope that it is also known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So I want to pause there. We're going to come back to this section and keep reading. But the big section that I want for us to think about right now is what I read in verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. The first thing I want to say about the mission, because we're talking about this mission, right? The mission that never changes while we, while we adapt our methods, that truth about Jesus. We're going to dive in on that really deep in a second. But the first thing I want to talk about with the mission is that the mission is motivated by our relationship with God. Our mission to, to invite our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus has to be motivated from our relationship with God. And that's what he's describing in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10, and where he talks, does all this talk about tents and earthly dwellings, right? Which, how many of you have been camping before? How many of you know that like, camping's fun for a night? And then on the second night, you wish you could go home 
and sleep in your regular bed. And so Paul says it's kind of like that. That's kind of what our existence as believers is now. Like it's, we're grateful we have a shelter. We're grateful we're you know, alive. But we really want to go home because our back hurts because we're sleeping on the ground, right? And, and, so, and, and so he talks about this idea. What's he, what is he really talking about? He's talking about resurrection, which is the essence of the gospel, right? That we have this promise that one day at the end of our lives or when Jesus comes back, we're going to be glorified the same way Jesus' body was glorified and we're going to live in this eternal state where everything is the way it was always supposed to be and it's going to be good instead of bad. And praise the Lord. How many of you can get excited about that? The idea of the resurrection. It's not just an idea, it's a truth, it's a fact, it's our hope, he says. He says, but along with that, that's good news, right? He says, but along with that, we have the recognition that it, what he says in verse 10, that everybody, we all, he says, must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, for you and me as believers, is that a fearful moment? This is a fearful moment. Some of us, we've been convinced by the enemy that it is, we're afraid of that moment, even though we're in Christ. We haven't really come around to the idea that we're actually fully forgiven. But for us as believers, the judgment seat of Christ is like a, a joyous moment, an occasion, and we get to celebrate that, that what, like his righteousness has been imputed to us and we're saved, and, and it's really just the beginning of our new life in him, in eternity. But it's not going to be that way for everybody. The judgment seat of Christ is, is, this, is this moment of, of love, but it's also this moment of wrath, right? It says that each one may will repay for what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And he says, therefore, and here's the thing, this is a pastor cliche, a pastor thing, uh, but we always say in, in uh, uh, they always say that we're supposed to, when we see a therefore, we're supposed to ask what it is there for. Okay, so when you see a therefore, it's usually right before something really important is about to happen in the passage. And it's usually a way of saying, with all that I just said being in your mind, I want you to think about this. This is my conclusion. So with all that truth about the resurrection, with all that truth about the judgment seat of Christ in your minds, I want you to think about this. Therefore, he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Knowing who our God is and that he made us, knowing that he loves us and sent his son to die for us, and not only that he died, but that he resurrected so that he could be the firstborn of the, of the, of the resurrection so that we could follow him as brothers and sisters. Knowing all that, he summarizes that in a phrase that's sort of unfamiliar to us sometimes. It's the fear of the Lord, right? Some of you have been told by a parent at one point. They were going to put the fear of the Lord in you, right? But what is the fear of the Lord? <laughs> the fear of the Lord is this, is this idea of, of, of summarizing this love and wrath that God has, right? And in the cross, God's love and wrath is seen perfectly, and it's not two sides of a coin. It's two things he is 100% all the time. He's holy and he's loving, all at the same time. He's full of love and wrath all at the same time. And Jesus' death on the cross proved that, right? Because it's a sign of his love for us, but it's also a sign of just how bad our sin was compared to a holy God. That's wrath. And so he says, knowing this, he says, we persuade others. It makes sense, right? If we all are going to be before the judgment seat of Christ, we, and we know how to, for somebody to go from lost to found, we ought to be about, he says, persuading others. And notice it doesn't say that we invite others to church. And it doesn't say that we post vaguely about it on Facebook, right? And it doesn't say that we, we, we Bible bash people with, with Bible answers to their questions, right? It says we persuade others. It's a very important word. In English, persuade means to cause somebody to understand or do something through reasoning and through an argument. Through reasoning and through an argument. 
this actually, the, the, the Greek word that's here is the root word for the word that we translate faith, right? So though the Bible never specifically says that we're supposed to share our faith, how many of you heard that phrase before, right? That we're to share our faith with others. This idea of persuasion is kind of that, that we're to share, help people to see things from God's perspective. We're to share our biblical worldview with them. We're, we're to share with them an argument and persuasion in a way that makes sense to them. How many of you know that communication is less about what I say and more about how the person I'm talking to hears it? Some of you guys are married and you know the importance of that, right? Because we can think that we're communicating. We can think we're saying something. We're, we're, I, to- I thought we talked about this, right? Many of you had that conversation recently. Right? So communication requires us putting care and and paying attention and thought into the person receiving it. Why is our mission to invite our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus? Because of what Jesus has done for us in Christ Jesus. That's thing number one. Because of the hope that is in us is available to everyone. Right? We have, the, we have the bandages. We have the wine and the oil, right, from the story of the Good Samaritan. We have the required items and the skills to be able to, to bring somebody from death to life. God's given it to us in His Word. Because if the shoe was on the other foot, right, like we talked about last week, we would want somebody to do it for us. And that's important for us to think about. The mission not only is motivated by our relationship with God and the truth from, about Him from His Word, but it changes how we look at people. Look at verse 14. He says, I love this phrase. He says, the love of Christ controls us. I hope that's true. I pray that's true in my life, right? That the love of Christ controls me. That the, he says, the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. That one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. There's a lot going on in that sentence. We don't have time to talk about this morning, but there's a lot going on right there, right? One has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's good, isn't it? It's, It's a little bit hard to follow. But it's really powerful. And in verse 16, he says, From now on, therefore, there's another therefore, right? Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ Jesus reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. And I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the next point. But what I, what, the second thing the mission does is it changes how we look at people. One of the things this section clarifies is what we are persuading others about. It does not talk about how we are persuading others to immediately change their sinful habits and, their, and their, their sinful patterns and their harmful habits. It's not saying convince people to live the Christian life so they can come to Jesus. That's backwards. We convince people about the truth of Jesus and then Jesus changes their life. But so often we want to put the cart before the horse. We want to see the people see people look like church people before we invite them to church, right? We want to we want to see uh, we want to get people uh, uh, healthy before they show up to the hospital. It's like I'm coming to the hospital because I need medical attention. <laughs> so don't okay. So anyway, I'm getting lost on that, but we're not persuading others to agree 100% with our theology. Some of us, we love doctrine, we love theology, we love apologetics. And we so we come in, we want to talk about predestination, and we want to talk about gifts of the Spirit on day one, and we lose people. And we, we forgot that we're not persuading others to our opinions or to our side of, an, of a theological argument or a debate. 
We're not trying to get people 100% to get everything right on day one. We're to persuade others about Jesus and Him crucified. And then when, and then when they're believers and they get the Holy Spirit and they start reading their Bible, guess what? He's going to help them sort all that other stuff out. Uh, we're not persuading others to join our cause or our political convictions. We're not getting people to vote right and fix the government, right? If people came to Christ, that stuff would change. But we've got to get them to come to Christ before we fix all that other stuff. And so here's the thing. We persuade others to respond to the simple message about Jesus' life, death, and his resurrection. We, his life first, right? That Jesus lived, that Jesus was real. We are persuaded that there is a God and that he made himself known through his son, Jesus Christ. And that he was fully God, that he was fully man, that he lived a totally perfect life. And ironically, a perfect life is not lifestyles of the rich and famous. It's not that he was rich. It's not that he was popular. He was popular, but he wasn't rich. And, and so, but that's not even the point. He simply existed a subsistence lifestyle in perfect communion with his heavenly father and with the people around him. He was sinless. So that Jesus lived, that's the first thing, right? And some people, most people will take, will admit, if you talk to them, they have to agree because of the historical evidence that at least Jesus existed, right? So we can start there. They might not agree about what Jesus did while he was alive, but they, might, they probably agree that he was a real person. And they probably also will agree that he died, because there's so much historical evidence about his death, it's hard to refute it, right? That Jesus died. Jesus gave his life. We are persuaded that Jesus died on a cross after being rejected by his own people, the Jews, and betrayed by a beloved friend. And that his death on a brutal public shaming execution device was not even the worst part of it, because the worst part of it was the separation that he experienced from his father on that cross because of our sin. So Jesus' life and Jesus' death, but that's not where it stops. Most people will agree with you that Jesus lived. Most people will agree with you that he died. This is the part that is the hinge point, right? The resurrection. Jesus' resurrection. Jesus came back from the dead. We are persuaded that after three days, in accordance with the patterns and the promises of the Hebrew Scriptures, Jesus' broken body was restored and glorified, and that he not only did that, but he gave evidence of it, that he appeared to hundreds of women and men over a series of weeks, and that there was eyewitness testimony to the fact that, well, guy that they put on the ground was alive and that he was well. And this miracle proved that he was God as well as his identity as the Messiah, which means anointed king. And so this resurrection means that everyone, and this is the key part, right? Because you can believe that it happened, or you can think, okay, that's a great story. But if you believe that it happened and you are willing to name him as your Lord to say, he's the king of my life, since he is the king of everything, he might as well be the king of my life that everyone who does that will join him in resurrection and are changed forever on that very day. That's the gospel. That's what we persuade people about. And we can do that because the scriptures give us the tools. And by the way, we're better equipped now than ever with evidence, historical, geographical, real evidence that this stuff happened. And not only that, it's not our job, by the way, to convince people it's simply our job to be faithful witnesses, and he does the work. He's the one that does the work. It's God's work, he says. He says, all this is from God, in verse 18, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, and this is a big word, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. It's not our appeal. It's not our message. It's his message. It's his work. 
We implore you, he says, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, talking about Jesus here, right? He says, for our sake, he made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we know from this section that the, the, miss, the mission is God's work. We are simply serving him. We are his servants. We are his messengers. The word that is used in the English Standard Version is that, he is, that we are ambassadors. And that word ambassador carries a lot of weight, right? Here's the thing. Today's culture celebrates diversity and inclusivity. And in many ways, those are, that's a reality only because of the gospel and what the gospel did in the Western cultures for thousands of years, right? Before the Judeo-Christian values that we talk about, right, there was no culture that celebrated inclusivity and diversity. But what's ironic is those ideas and those values in our culture now have been twisted and weaponized in a way that we no longer feel like we can actually talk about the gospel. Because there's this unwritten rule in our, in our world and in our culture that you're allowed to believe what you want to believe, which is great. Um, you're, you're allowed to believe really whatever you want to believe. Just look at the internet and you'll find all kinds of crazy things that people believe and they're allowed to believe them. So you're allowed to believe whatever you want to believe but we draw the line as a culture when it comes to convincing other people to believe what I believe. Now, all of a sudden, that is offensive. And the problem, it's not really a problem, but the, the, the conflict now for the church, the conflict for us as believers, is we live in a culture that's fine with you believing whatever you want to believe. But if you believe that what you believe is the ultimate truth and that everything else is wrong... See, we've entered into dangerous waters as a culture. And even as a pastor, I sometimes feel uncomfortable talking about the gospel to people in our culture today. People have no problem with me being a Christian and believing what I want to believe. Sometimes they're even fascinated to hear what I believe. But the minute it turns to a response, right? The minute it turns to asking people, what do you believe, right? And confronting their potentially wrong beliefs. It gets, it gets uncomfortable. That's because the gospel claims to be ultimate truth. God claims to be, uh, Jesus said it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Exclusivity. It's just me, he says. The important thing for us is we feel these cultural pressures because they're real. And I believe it's one of the reasons why, as churches, we don't see people coming to Christ on a regular basis like you might have seen 50 years ago. What we have to remember is what Paul says in these verses. We are not the ones responsible for the content of the gospel. He started off by saying, all this is from God. It wasn't my idea, Paul says. It's God's message. He says, in his divine nature and love, he saw fit to reveal himself to his creation and to mankind in this way. We don't need to apologize for the exclusive nature of the Christian faith because it wasn't our idea. We're just invited to the party. <laughs> We're just loved by a God who loves uh, us and sent a son to die for us. And this is the truth. And that's what we've got. And so not only that, we have to recognize that the work of sharing the gospel is not our work. God, it says, is reconciling the world to himself. God's doing it. He's the one who accomplishes the task. He doesn't need us. But in his infinite wisdom, he chooses to use us. And he calls us ambassadors. Now, that's a powerful image, isn't it? Who's an ambassador? What's an ambassador? An ambassador is a person, right? sent from a king, sent from a country to a foreign land or to a foreign person or a foreign embassy with a message, right? With a, or with a responsibility to convey messages, to be the one who makes the connection between two different kingdoms, two different cultures, two different worlds, right? 
And to do that in a way that ultimately honors and represents the king they were sent from. How powerful what an image is that? So I want us to think about this for just a minute as we close this out. Because Paul says we are all ambassadors of Christ. And ambassadors first have to know the message inside and out. If you are an ambassador, if you are somebody given a task to deliver a message to a foreign king, to a foreign land, to a foreign government, you better know that message that you're being sent with, right? You better study it. It's actually interesting. One of the words that's connected to this word in the Greek language that Paul is using here is the same word for um, basically like a preacher or an elder, like a leader in the church. What's fascinating is Paul here is not talking about like an office. What he is talking about is a skill level with the gospel. And what he's saying is this, as we are sent out into the world on this mission to invite our neighbors to meet and follow Jesus... We better know what's in here. That's where it starts. Right? We would not send, as a, as a country, we would not send like a middle schooler to be an ambassador for the country. Right? We would, we, we would find somebody who is incredibly versed, incredibly, like they better have a PhD, right? Be incredibly educated. And that does not mean that as believers we've got to wait till we know everything in order to be a representative. What it does mean is, as God's representatives, this is our first job. To know what's in the book. To know who God is. To know our king so that we can represent him to others. So whether we're a middle schooler or whether we're uh, 80 years old, right? This is our first job as ambassadors. To know what's in the book. To know the message backwards and forwards. Ambassadors... uh, learn to speak the language of the people they're going to represent their king to, right? How shameful, how embarrassing would it be for us to send an ambassador to a country and him just decide to not learn the language? Well, they they can just learn to speak my language, right? And so often this is what we do as a church, is what we do as believers. We run into, we go and we we post the Bible Bible post or the thing on Facebook and we we expect it's going to, like, carry some kind of weight in people's life, but where it's so full of language that people don't understand that they, they just walk right past it, right? How many of you know that like words like, um, words like sin and wrath and atonement and born again, these are all words that we use in church all the time, but to somebody else, they might as well sound like technical jargon. They don't necessarily make sense. And so we have to learn to speak a language that makes sense to the people we're representing Jesus to. Beyond that, we have to learn, we have to become students of the culture. This doesn't mean that we become the culture, but like Paul says when he says, I I became a Jew to the Jews so that I could win Jews, and I became like a Gentile to Gentiles so that I could win Gentiles, that on one hand kind of sounds like Paul, are you just like a chameleon, you just change who you are? I don't think that's what he's saying at all. But that he knows when he walks into a Jewish deli versus a Gentile uh, wine bar that there are two very different cultures he's talking to. And some of you guys know, like, in Sebring, we have a, we're a diverse culture, right? There's all kinds of different people. There's the, there's the, there's the snowbird culture, and there's the local culture, and there's, there's, um, there's just all kinds of cultures that we walk into. Some of us are familiar with them because that's our native culture. But here's the crazy thing. Paul says, I became Jew, a Jew to, be, to witness the Jews. And we would say, well, uh, Paul, aren't you already a Jew? But see, that's significant right there, because Paul, had no, Paul no longer identified himself. He was physically Jewish. His ethnicity was Jewish, but that was no longer his identity. His identity was a, was a member of the, and, a, and a representative of the kingdom of God. So even in his own family, even in his own business, even in his own workplace, even in his own school, right? He acted like he was, he, he, he understood that he was a foreign ambassador, right? But see, the, our problem is we're so worried about um, how our culture's changing and how we need to, to win it back. When Jesus says, actually, you're no longer a member of that culture, you're no longer a citizen of that country, your citizenship is in heaven. 
And so you come into that place and it better feel strange. It better feel foreign. Because you don't belong there. This isn't your home. This isn't your culture. This is a, so you study and you learn how that you, so that you can bring Christ to the people who are talking a different language, right? And who believe things that you don't believe anymore. How many of you know that's like a weird situation? You can come to Christ and all of a sudden you're the foreigner in your family. You're, you're, you're a stranger in the workplace to people you otherwise you would be good friends with. Now, now there's this weird thing, right? And, and Jesus says, that's actually on purpose because you don't belong there. It's not your home. He says, ambassadors, ultimately, this is the last point, and then I'll finish up. He says, they have no confusion about who they work for. An ambassador to a foreign country, an ambassador in a foreign embassy in another land is not concerned, ultimately, about pleasing the people that he or she delivers the message to. It's his job to get out of the way of the message, right? And translating and in being understanding their culture and not offending their culture. But he says, but ultimately the offense and how they feel isn't his concern when it comes to the message, right? They do all they can to keep the message clear and they want to be considerate in their posture and their attitude, but they would never, ever consider changing the message to suit the person receiving it. Because ultimately, an ambassador has clarity about who they are responsible to. They were sent from the king. And we were sent by Jesus, right? To be an ambassador, to share this simple message about his life and his death and his resurrection with the people around us. And we can't change that message. We shouldn't want to change it. Because it's ultimately the good news. It's the good news that saved us, that changed us. That that God didn't see us in our brokenness and give up on us, but instead saw us and he had compassion and he healed us and he restored us and he made it possible for us to share with others. So the relationship with the receiver of the message, with the people we're sent to to preach and to persuade, right? That, That is an important relationship, but it pales in comparison to our relationship as ambassadors to the one who sent us and to the king who died for us and and, and who's given us this, he says, a ministry of reconciliation. So I'll read it again as we close. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive grace of God in vain.